All right, 3.30. Thanks, everybody, for coming to my talk. Uh, some of you were just in my director Jill's talk about uh, our migration from Drupal 7 to Drupal 9. Um, we migrated to this platform we call Site Builder, which is uh, our um, you know, Drupal as a service platform for building websites. Uh, so this is uh, who I work for, Web Development Services and OIT. It's just a screenshot of our website. Um, so Jill always likes to say, WDS, we do sites. Um, so I would say at Princeton, uh, you know, we're part of central IT and we probably are responsible for the majority of like the websites that are hosted for departments, programs, and centers, and individual people like scholars, um, researchers, that sort of thing. So we've got uh, uh, you know different tiers of service that we do, but um, the main one we have that most people use is you know Princeton Site Builder. It's like a self-service platform. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about the architecture that went behind building it. Um, at least the current version of it, we refer to it as version two. Um, and uh, yeah, so WDS, we've been working with Drupal for over 10 years. I think this is like, what, the 10th year of Drupal Camp New Jersey or the 11th? 11th, yeah. So it started uh, the first year that WDS got involved with Drupal uh, when we were migrating off of Roxen, uh, an old content management system. Um, yeah, so we don't just do Drupal, we have like 20 to 30 custom PHP applications as well, um, but most of our focus is on Drupal. And WordPress too, I shouldn't forget WordPress. We also host WordPress, uh, a big WordPress multi-site installation. We don't do a whole lot of custom development on it. Um, we're just sort of like hosting it and you know, administering what plugins are available for people to install, that sort of thing. But um, most of our focus is on Site Builder. So, uh, yeah, Site Builder. Um, we have uh, about a thousand websites on it now. Uh, so it, it's quite a bit. Um, it's, it's a multi site setup. Uh, it's hosted in Acquia's infrastructure in a service that they called Site Factory, which is sort of optimized with uh, you know, our product offering, where you've got uh, you know, many, many websites and you need to be able to manage them effectively. They're all hosted basically on the same set of shared hardware. So um, while we do have actually two separate sets, they're split into two stacks as Acquia calls them. There's 500 on each one. Um, but like, you know, the human resources website is on the same web server as finance and treasury, uh, on the same website as history. So uh, the department of history. Um, so there, it's a multi-site setup. Um, Acquia does it sort of in a unique way to make it maintainable and scalable. But at the end of the day, it's Drupal multi-site. Uh, the first site on this platform, the new one, uh, was launched in early 2019 for the Office of the Registrar. Uh, that site um, in particular was launched here because it did not rely on a lot of features that we didn't have ready yet. Uh, there's no images on that site. <laughs> we had no solution in place at the time for media management at all. Uh, hadn't figured that out yet. So that was a good site to sort of get on there. There's not a whole lot of content on there aside from like, you know, the course offering search that students use, which isn't really Drupal but anyway. It's a Vue.js app. But um, that was a good candidate. And sort of our approach in the beginning here was, uh, we know we're not gonna have time to really complete the platform as a whole to make it ready for every site. Uh, but, you know, we'll start launching sites on them. And, you know, when we get a new site come in that needs to be built, okay, can the platform handle it? Um, and uh, or is, are we missing too many features and we have to put it on our old platform for now uh, or do something custom? So that was our approach in early 2019. Uh, Jill talked about this, if you were in her talk, this is a real high level overview. Jill, I actually pulled this from a project initiation document I saw on Google Drive, uh, some of these, these bullet points. But uh, yeah, I mean, the purpose of the the platform, it has to serve a non-technical audience. You need to be you know, a site administrator going in, say you work for the Department of History, for example, you maybe you wear many hats within that department. You're not administering a website all day. It's gotta be relatively easy for you to go in and manage a site. We don't count on you having like the technical skills to like even know what Drupal is, okay? We don't actually make a point of even saying that this is running Drupal a lot of the time. We call it Princeton Site Builder, not like Princeton Drupal Site Builder. 
Um, so uh, it has to, you know, scale well. So, uh, you know, we're, we're developing it in such a way that um, we'll, we'll reap the benefits when there's a lot of websites on it, okay? So there's a big upfront cost to develop this platform, but with the end goal of being able to put a lot of sites on it. Uh, so, you know, we centralize security and accessibility, that's huge. Um, accessibility changes that we make to make the platform more accessible, examples for like, you know, browsing the main menu. When we make a change that has immediate impact on a thousand websites. Uh, whereas if you've got all these other websites hosted in different platforms, um, remediating accessibility issues is a lot, a lot more difficult. Um, we wanted to remove the need for what we call custom websites. Uh, so we had you know, this old site builder platform, which we now refer to as version one, that uh, you know, was really locked down in what you could do. You couldn't create custom content types, you couldn't create custom taxonomy vocabulary, so the information architecture for the sites that we could put on there was very limited, and we had to do sort of hacky workarounds. Um, sometimes we had to you know, take the site and just make a completely custom Drupal site out of it. Um, or we had to make a lot of compromises that the site owner maybe wasn't happy with. So we wanted to reduce the need for the bit like, you know, forcing people to not use our platform because it wasn't extensible enough, while also making it maintainable. Um, it's really hard to balance that. That was one thing I struggled with a lot, to make sure that the customizations we did, we did unlock uh, weren't like shooting ourselves in the foot later on, making them too difficult to maintain. Uh, so, yeah, okay. So this started, I found this document that I started uh, in 20, 18 or maybe even 2017 uh, for an architecture document. And this is just uh, a really big document that I started writing, it ended up being around 20 or 30 pages. And it listed out all these major bullet points and how we did it on Drupal 7 on our old platform and how we should do it moving forward. A lot of this was evaluating at the time, it was I think Drupal 8.2 or maybe 8.1, what the capabilities were in Drupal core and the contrib space for things like layout management and media management. And doing this document was really important uh, to make sure that we were making the right decisions uh, up front because uh, you know, a lot of what we learned from the old platform is when we had, you know, when we were just getting started with Drupal, there were, especially in Drupal 7, there's so many ways to do like layout, for example. And we used all of them. <laughs> so it's really hard to maintain. Um, you know, when you have module updates, when you have a team of developers that, you know, someone takes vacation, they built that website, okay, there's a problem with the site, how was that built? Uh, so, you know, having this in place to figure out like how we're gonna do config management, where we're gonna host it, the dev environment, access control, these are like the big key functions that we need to figure out early on. Uh, so this is a screenshot of a site building guide. Uh, so this is another long document, it's around 30 pages. It sort of uh, serves as a reference guide for our developers within WDS. So if you request a site for Site Builder, you know, we can give you a site and show you our, the link to our documentation and it can be completely self-service, right? You can just use our documentation and build the site on your own. Uh, but you can also pay us and we will uh, do some customizations on that site, some of which involves doing custom design, uh, so theming, but a lot of it is custom content architecture. So, you know, the standard content types we ship with, why they, you know, they're useful and extensible, they don't um, capture, you know, the use case that the graduate school might have for representing fields of study. So we have to create a custom content type for that. So when we do that, we need to make sure that we're doing it in a really consistent way and we're following some sort of guide because we have a lot of developers that are doing this going into the sites. We wanna make sure that, you know, when you're creating a custom content type, you're using the same sort of um, naming convention for the machine name for the fields. Um, you know, I don't expect you to be able to read the small text here, but on the left side here, you can see just sort of the menu, the types of things that uh, we talk about. So like, it says, you know, you can create custom taxonomy vocabularies, but um, and you can create custom fields on custom content types, but you can't modify our standard content types. We have like a news and event content type, for example. You can't go in and add a custom field if it just doesn't exist there. Uh, we need to know that some of the configuration we ship within the platform is owned by the platform, so that when we do monthly 
code updates, we can reliably know that if we like revert configuration to deploy a new update to that content type, we're not breaking a site that we customized. So we did really selective ways of allowing customizations that work with the platform maintainability. So we can add um, you know, custom taxonomy vocabularies and custom taxonomy uh, reference fields to those vocabularies on our standard content types. That allows us to do things out of the box without a whole lot of customization that we could not do on our old platform for content architecture purposes. You know, we ship with like a, our content types have like a news category for the news content type, an event category for event. But sometimes you just need a couple more categories, right? Um, and ways to filter them. So we, we allow uh, that to happen. WDS does it. We don't uh, allow the site owners to do it at the moment, but that lets us ha have a lot of flexibility and this is the guide that we follow to make sure it's maintainable. So site builder capabilities. Uh, so here's some quick stats that scared me a little bit when I collected them. Uh, so we have like 80,000 lines of custom PHP uh, spread across 60 custom modules. Um, seems like a lot. I, I looked at the, the views module in Drupal core, which is a, a fairly large module and um, using the same methodology I did to count that line, uh, the lines on our custom code I did on that one, and Views has around 50,000 lines of code. So it seems like a lot. Um, why so much custom code? <laughs> so many of these custom modules that we wrote are quite small. Um, they do like lots of little tweaking and things like that. Um, if we didn't have a lot of this custom code, we'd be using contrib solutions to solve the problems and probably be even more lines of code. Um, so I'll get into that in the, the next slide too. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm generally a fan of creating custom con or custom solutions for things if the amount of code is going to be like dramatically less than if you had to use a contrib module. So this is across all of our websites. We have about a quarter of a million nodes. I actually thought it'd be higher than that, which is um, which is good. I've talked to some people recently where they have that amount of content on one website. Um, we have a very long tail of websites where the tail um, has like no content. So uh, a lot of our sites that are meant for like faculty and researchers, there's like three pages on the sites. Um, but that's like half of our websites, 500 of them. We have a very small percentage of the sites that have a very large percentage of the content. Um, big sites like graduate school, for example, um, a lot of the administrative departments, they have a lot of content. Okay, so custom versus contrib. This comes up a lot. Um, this is something I always struggled with, especially at the beginning, doing the platform architecture. Um, so, yeah, our custom code has lots and lots of little tweaks. Uh, we've removed a lot of Drupalisms from the UI. Um, you know, references to things that our site owners will see that talk about things like nodes. Uh, explaining what a node is to someone who's not technical, first you have to explain, you know, it's a very abstract concept. And just referring to them as content items instead, while not technically true, uh, you know, helps a lot of people understand what we're talking about. So we make tweaks in the UI to do things like that. In the admin toolbar UI, for example, uh, to, to administer user accounts on the website, uh, the admin menu is called people. But we have a person content type for like displaying administrative staff on your website. That's confusing. People are gonna click that thinking that's where you go to add a little bio about yourself for your website. So we change the label to users. A lots of our code does things like that. Um, so most of the contrib solutions that you'll see out there uh, solve an 80% use case for you, maybe 90. And that 10% is the frustrating part that you wish it did, right? And if the module maintainer solved that for you, now the module's got more bloat, it's doing more things. Um, and it's oftentimes easier just to do something custom. And I think this is especially true when you're building a platform. Uh, the decisions we make when we're maintaining and building a platform, we're going to live with for years and years and years. If we're adding a dependency to a contrib module, we're basically tying um, our maintainability and maintenance to, to that external dependency, right? That we have a lot less control over. So 
a lot of contrib solutions spend a lot of time and effort on um, forms, config forms, that you will visit literally once after you install the module and configure it. That's a lot of code that you're adding to, the, to generate this UI that is completely irrelevant for us as platform maintainers, where the, the configuration is all centralized. We don't need a UI for it. So, you know, you're adding, you're adding to trip solutions that adds a lot more line of code that it's just easier not to have on the platform. Here's a, an example of some of the custom modules we have. The two columns on the right there, those are um, mostly revolving around custom content types, or what I should call standard content types. So when you request a site on our platform, we provision it for you. Unless you request a starter kit, you get basically nothing. You get the page content type and like the ability to add like media, images and videos and that sort of thing. But you can go in and you can enable all these optional modules. Some of these WDS has to enable on your behalf, but a lot of them is, are available to you to enable. Uh, so if you want to add courses and events and news, you can go in and do that. Uh, some of our custom modules on the left are access control, uh, feed blocks. I'm going to get into some of those. Okay. Feed blocks. So this is a good example that I wanted to bring up where I first tried to use um, an existing solution to this. So. A lot of our sites want to display a feed of content from another source. Um, an example is a screenshot here. In the middle column there, it's called the Fishbowl. We have a website for information security. And they uh, display a list um, of items that they identify as part of the Fishbowl, which are phishing email attacks that are sent to Princeton employees. So if you get like a suspicious email, you can go to this website and be like, oh, yeah, this is a fake email that I got because it's been reported that way. I know, I know this is bogus. This feed comes from some other website um, in our uh, ServiceNow solution, but a lot of our sites have similar problems where they want to display feeds like this. So Drupal Core has a module called Aggregator, which is meant for pulling in stuff from an RSS feed, and that's what these are. So I first started to use that, because um, like, okay, this should be like a low-code, no-code solution. It's a Drupal Core module, super well-supported, right? Um, so I started down that path, but Aggregator imports content into a custom entity type, and it doesn't really handle the use case where if there's an item that's been deleted from the source feed, um, you don't want it showing up on the website anymore. Uh, it's, you know, you're, you're importing content to display, and, you know, that, that presumption's not there, but we have another website, oit.princeton.edu, that has a feed of alerts and outages. And when the alert or outage is done, it's removed from the feed, and you don't want to display it anymore. So uh, the core aggregator module does not handle that. You can sort of extend it to do that, which I tried, until I ran into a problem where uh, if there's no items in the feed at all, the code I wrote to extend it won't even run at all. Uh, so I eventually gave up, and I just wrote a custom solution, which ended up being um, much, much less code than what's in the aggregator module. Uh, aggregator has like 4,000 lines of code and the custom thing I wrote had like 850. And um, you know, this, this is the UI for configuring it. And I'm just showing this as a demonstration that, um, yeah, the contrib solutions out there and even the core modules, they're just not always a perfect fit for us. Um, so it's, you know, we can provide a much more uh, curated experience for our users where there's fewer compromises um, if we just develop a small custom solution on our own. Uh, another option here would be the feeds module. Uh, I don't know if anyone has experience with the feeds module, but uh, it's big, complicated, and very difficult to debug when things go wrong. Uh, so, you know, a large part of deciding how we architect things is maintainability, and when things go wrong, and they do, how quickly can we debug it and fix it? Um, because problems come up all the time, especially when you're interacting with third-party uh, services that are, you know, you're pulling data from them. You need to make sure the logging is really good and it's not going to take a developer all day to debug what's going on. Okay, so this is a screenshot of the content entry form for our page content type. Our page content type is sort of a dual-purpose content type in that, uh, you know, you can create it 
and you've got the WYSIWYG field with CK Editor and just put in like a big page of text and you can embed images in there if you want. But you can also use it um, with Layout Builder where every page that you create can have a unique layout. So you go, you save the page and then you get a Layout tab. Just the, you have to got like View, Edit, Delete and you also have Layout. And then you can go and you can basically create building blocks for your, for your page and you can add sections and blocks and configure them. This is what the content entry form for that content type looks like. Uh, we made a lot of little tweaks to this. So the, the title uh, field at the top, we made much larger, uh, the font size bigger. If you notice on the body field, it says edit summary and edit lead right next to each other. Um, Drupal core has this um, uh, you know, text area body field type that has that summary field on it, but it doesn't have the concept of a lead field. A lead is just something that you'd want to appear like prominently at the beginning of an article or a page. So we added that lead field and styled it in the same way, made it work the same way as the uh, summary field does in Drupal core. Um, we added the save and add another button, which I think is a contrib module, but it's literally like six lines of code. So why add the contrib module? Um, something simple to do that. On the right side there, we've got a featured image. All of our standard content types put this concept of the featured image field over in the sidebar, so they're all standardized like that. Um, featured images are used you know, when we're displaying the content in list blocks and on the detail page. So you can control the featured image display field there. You can hide it from the detail page or you can um, indicate if you want it like browser width, content width, um, and then what aspect ratio you want to display in. Um, featured icon is, uh, you know, you can upload an SVG icon. That's a very unique use case where you're displaying it on list block. Um, you can have the icon overlaid on top of the featured image if you want. Um, and uh, same settings for the feature icon display there. Uh, create jump link menu is something custom we did for the menu. So uh, what the way that works, a, a jump link menu is just a sort of a static navigation that follows you when you're browsing down a page and you can click items on it and it jumps you to that part of the page. That's like a smooth scrolling action. So we use that a lot. In fact, I know we use it a lot because we just have to refactor something about it and I had to scan all the pages on it. Uh, and there's like 600 pages across all of our sites that have some form of using that. The um, way that works is it'll scan the page for every he uh, heading level two element um, and pull that out into a dynamic jump link menu automatically. And then there's the categorization sidebar all the way at the bottom. Um, and that's expanding all of our taxonomy term vocabularies uh, for categorizing your content will appear over there. So all of those little tweaks, custom code to make that happen. Uh, this is a, our document library. So we're using the core media module to handle media. Um, Drupal core considers documents media, which I thought is sort of a little weird of a concept. Uh, to me, documents are not really in the same boat as uh, like images and videos and that sort of thing, especially when you're talking about um, displaying them in a grid with thumbnails. So the thumbnail icon for a document is always just going to be like a boring document icon and doesn't serve a lot of purpose to have an icon for it at all. So we split it out to like the main media library um, does not list any of the documents and we have a separate document library that gives you more information that's relevant just for viewing documents. Content list blocks, uh, I would say this is like the killer feature of the platform that um, you know, makes it really easy to build and list content on the site. So the screenshots are a little confusing. Think of them all stacked on top of each other. I just had to split the screenshot up and um, slices like this, but uh, this is a page list block configuration. So um, you know, all of our list blocks here, you, know, you can specify the title for the block, you can choose how the content for the block is, um, is selected. So you can either manually choose the content by um, using these autocomplete fields where you just type in the name. So in this case, alert, course, and event are um, names of other pages. And um, you can drag and drop and reorder them to control whatever position you want them to be in the list block and when it's being displayed. And I'm sorry, list block, I should say, is just something you'd use Drupal views for for listing content on your site and putting it in a block in Layout Builder. It's so like, say, to show your upcoming events or upcoming news. In this case, you're just showing a, a list of pages. So that's one option to display it manually, or you can dynamically have the, the, the list populated. And that's what you would use for displaying things like upcoming events or um, latest news that was published. 
So you select the row style, so you can have it output as a standard list, output in a grid or a compact list. If you select grid, you can choose how many columns it outputs into. For anyone that's familiar with Drupal, this is basically what views lets you do. But we didn't want to give our site owners access to use views because it's like, uh, it's just too much, right? There's, there's too much you can do in views. You can really get in trouble. There's lots of stuff you can customize and configure in there. And we just needed a really simple way for non-technical people to go in and create lists of content. Um, so this is sort of like our own little views light to, to, to do this. So on the, in the middle column here, we have individual checkboxes for toggling the display of all of the fields. So this is obviously different, like this is a page list block, but for events list block, you can toggle the display of the date, the event location, that sort of thing. Uh, for some of those fields, if you toggle them, for example, if you toggle featured image on, you can control what aspect ratio the image will be displayed in. So it gives a lot of flexibility. Um, enable a view all link and no results behavior. And then on the right, um, how you want it sorted, the number of items to display if you want to enable a pager, and then the filters. So the filters are really what give you a lot of power for the um, content architecture of the site. So, you know, display a list of news, but only if the news is tagged as featured, for example. Um, so these content list blocks are available for all of our standard content types for like news events, um, people, courses, things like that. And um, it's all custom code. I would say most of that 80,000 lines of custom code, a lot of it is uh, powering this. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is a module I wrote called Taxonomy Reference Manager. So when you edit a taxonomy of vocabulary in Drupal, uh, the fields that you get I think are just like title and description. So everything else on this form is something we added. And it lets us create custom taxonomies on sites and then very quickly add the taxonomy reference fields to the co our standard content types to reference that vocabulary. So this prevents the developer from having to go in to create the vocabulary, then manually go to each content type and add the taxonomy reference field, configure it, and um, hope that no one made a mistake and configure it in such a way that that change is gonna be blown away when we do our next monthly platform release. <laughs> so this makes sure that everything is done standardized and correctly. Um, so in this case, this website has the alert module, the event module, and the person module enabled. So we have those, those content types available. So we can go in and uh, say that the academic term vocabulary that we're adding should be available in the event content type. You hit save and it'll programmatically create the taxonomy term reference field for that content type. Um, you can choose the form widget that gets displayed on the, the node form. And then you can choose to put in that categorization sidebar I showed you before, or if you want in the main body of the form. This is something that we borrowed from uh, Open Scholar. Open Scholar is an old Drupal 7 platform that we uh, are just about finished migrating from, but they gave you this capability. And that, that's uh, one of the features from that platform I really liked. Uh, layout Builder Styles. So this is a module I wrote, uh, I think a few years ago now, that I contributed back. So this is available on drupal.org. And um, this was a way that we could give our design team and our site builders um, the power to influence the style of layouts on their site without having to like go in and know CSS and things like that. So, you know, our design team can go in and create these styles. Um, and the way this works is you just give it a label and you indicate, okay, does this style apply to blocks that you put in the layout or sections? Um, and then you just indicate what CSS classes should get applied to the section or block if this style is chosen, and that's it. Beyond that, um, the actual styling to do something with that CSS class has to be injected with CSS injector, which we'll do sometimes, or it has to be part of the custom theme that we developed for that website. Um, but here on the left here, you can see when you're in um, uh, layout builder and you're adding a block or a section to a page, you can choose from the list of styles to apply it. So um, this, is a, this is a great module. It's given us a lot of flexibility with um, to sort of add some more structure to custom CSS uh, that we add to sites. So, you know, instead of adding like, you know, you know, our old platform had a way of like, you could edit a block and add a CSS class to be applied. Instead of doing that, you're adding like, nice readable machine or human readable label for that customization. 
uh, instead. Uh, likewise, within CK Editor, uh, we have something called CK Editor Styles. This is another module that we contributed back. And uh, there's a UI to you know, define what styles are available within CK Editor. So um, in this case, this button here for the request to site, that's just a normal link that was added in CK Editor. And then you click the link, and then you can click the style drop down and apply primary or secondary button. Uh, this is another example, a Drupal core if you go in to um, the text format settings, you can do this too. Like you can define what styles are available in that dropdown, but we don't wanna give our site owners the ability to go in and modify the text format settings. So uh, this was a module that you, know, you only need if you're running basically a platform uh, where you need to uh, control what areas of the site someone has access to administer. Uh, this is uh, the footer content. Um, so we used, found a way to use Layout Builder to control the footer content on our websites too. So for those who are unfamiliar with Layout Builder, uh, it just lets you control like the content region of the, of the page. So you don't have control over like the header or the footer. So when you go to click the Layout tab, you can just basically control what's in between that. But a lot of our sites, we need to customize what's in the footer too. Um, so for this, we created a custom entity type uh, called footer that only has like one uh, entity and enabled layout builder on it and then styled it to make sure that uh, the contrast was right and everything in the footers because our footers are usually really dark. And so we just enable layout builder in there and you have basically full control over, you can um, add text blocks and images and stuff right in your footer. Uh, access control was another one we customized. So uh, there's a lot of solutions in Drupal con contrib space for access control. And when I did that architecture document I talked about, I evaluated all of them to see if we could use any, if they would work. Um, we probably could make some of them work, but none of them work like really well for our use case. We'd have to make some compromises or expose like weird Drupalisms to people. Um, so we developed a custom access control module that lets you Restrict content, this is just based on who can view the content. So most of our websites, I would say like 90% of them, they're just all public. So every page that you create on public, anyone in the world can go and view it. Um, we have some sites that are more like intranet use cases, uh, or some of the sites is like a uh, private content that's only available for certain people. The Office of the Registrar is a good example. They have some content on there that's um, meant for everybody, like students can go in there and view the courses and whatnot, but there's also stuff for administrators to go in to, to see like how to like register new courses that are being added to a department, things like that. So we have this access control checkboxes on pages that can be added. Um, Drupal has two different ways to really do access control. If you use the proper way um, and you say, okay, this node, for example, um, is only allowed to be viewed by authenticated users, Drupal won't even let you view a menu link to that page if you're not logged in. So that's a problem for most of our sites that want to restrict content because they still want to make the content discoverable in the menu. They just want to force you, when you're trying to view the full detail page for that content, they want to force you to log in. So that's not how Drupal's access control system, at least with nodes, works out of the box. So sometimes that's what we want. Uh, like if the entire website is going to be locked down, that's what we want but sometimes it's not. So, you know, you can select the, the simple method, which, you know, would basically just restrict your access to the node detail page. And then um, when you do that, you have this restricted link indicator that you can add so that when links to that page are being displayed on the website, we add a little lock icon next to it to indicate that if you're not logged in, you're about to be prompted to log in if you click that link. Um, restricted search results too, so that, uh, you know, normally Drupal's, if you use advanced here, it's going to use the normal node access method. It'll hide those items from search too. So if someone's searching for content, it's not going to show up if they're not logged in to view it, which is not great because they have to log in first, then search. It's not a great user experience. But you don't want like the search snippet to reveal secret information that's on that page um, unless they're logged in. So that'll restrict that too. So 
these modules didn't always start this way. They were a lot simpler when they started. And then as we get more use cases, of, you know, essentially as we're migrating some of these custom Drupal 7 sites we built long ago that have custom use cases, uh, we're expanding uh, what the capabilities are of these custom solutions. Uh, so this is the settings form or part of the settings form for content types. Uh, there's a few customizations here. One that's highlighted is still talking about access control. Um, where you know we can allow individual access control on each individual node for that content type, or we can say every single node of this content type should be restricted and should be stri restricted to people that have this role. Uh, so that gives us a lot of flexibility to do things like the intranet, um, intranet use case, where every page of the content type. And there's other ways to do something like this in Drupal. Like you can go in and say, go to the main permissions grid, and there's a permission in Drupal course that says like view publish content. Um, just take that away from anonymous users, right? But, you know, that whole permission system is managed and owned by the platform in a very specific way to make it maintainable. Uh, so that really wasn't an option. So this is the maintainable way that we came up with to make that work. Um, there's a few other things we added here, external site node redirect. So a few of our content types, like um, news, for example, uh, sometimes you just want to display a news article in like a list block, um, but the actual article is on some other website. Um, this is really common with sites here at Princeton where we have, you know, a lot of sites that are in the same family, same department, but they're like subsites. And maybe there's one site that publishes most of the news and all of the like sibling or sister sites, they want to display that news on their website, but not really host it. They just want to sort of promote it. Um, and the canonical source for that is some other website. So for news, um, we, we use that feature to turn that on and say, you know, if the news um, content type has uh, external site listed and a checkbox is checked that says, OK, redirect this news article to the external site, um, that'll work. Same thing for people. Uh, so some of our sites have um, like full bios for the people on, on the site but others, uh, the full bio is on someone else's website. So maybe you want to still display that person in a list block on your website, like a directory for the staff. But um, when they click the link to view more details, it goes to some other website. So that feature allowed us to do that on, co on our standard content types, but also custom content types that we develop for sites. Um, and then the detail page and search disabler, sometimes the detail pages for uh, content types are not needed. Um, that's often the case for uh, people where you're just displaying like basic information in a directory. Um, you don't really want the detail page exposed, uh, especially in search results, because um, you just don't intend people to see that. You want them to just go to the main directory page. Uh, this is a screenshot of the modules page that we expose to our site administrators. Uh, so that's like our lower role that we give out to um, uh, the actual site owners. and. Uh, this is like, I don't know, half of the modules maybe that we make available. And you can go in, like I said, when we provision a site for you, it's pretty bare bones unless you have a starter kit. Um, and all of these are uh, disabled. You can go in and enable them, and some of them have uh, settings forms that you can go in and customize uh, various settings. So here's an example of the settings form. I think this is for events. So we let you control like the date format that's used for displaying events on the detail page. Uh, what else is on there? You got a time format. If you want to add to calendar links. And then all of our standard content types give you the ability to control what happens to the taxonomy terms that are tagged with them. So a lot of times um, our taxonomy vocabularies are used just for filtering. So someone will tag a content for like featured on home page, right? But you don't actually want that taxonomy term floated and displayed anywhere to site visitors. You're using it basically just for backend administrative purposes for filtering content. But sometimes you want that, that taxonomy term displayed. So you can go into the site um, settings here for the module and for event audience, for example, you can control how it gets displayed on the detail page. Either just like a, a standard list of just the names of the taxonomy terms you can have the names but linked to the, text on, uh, the term detail page, or you can have the, uh, like a grid display with images for each taxonomy term, which is common if you know, you've got like a, a good example is a research area taxonomy that's used on, on some department pages where you've got like images for each research area and you're tagging content with that research area, you can display it. Okay, 
so local development. Um, so this is this is basically what we do. Uh, so we've got a team of developers and designers that are doing local development, and we're all on Macs, except for one developer who's using Linux. And we're using just pure Docker. We're not using the popular um, solutions like Lando, DDEV, or uh, Doxel. Those are all great solutions. In fact, we just started using DDEV for um, custom PHP applications we developed. But when I got started with this, uh, a lot of those solutions weren't super mature yet. And my main concern was not adding complexity to our local development um, by adding like another abstraction layer. So Doxel, DDEV, um, Lando, that's what they are. They're abstractions over Docker. And Docker itself is really not that complicated. Um, it's, it's, I found it easier for me to maintain just pure Docker than having to worry about uh, involving one of those solutions and then reading the release notes every time that there's, a, there's an update to that tooling. Uh, I think at the time I was like having tooling overload when I was getting into front end JavaScript development too. And it's just like spending all this time on tooling without actually spending time on the development is, is frustrating. So uh, I would say that the Docker setup has gone pretty smoothly. There's been some hiccups over time, but I'm confident that we would have had the same hiccups uh, with the other tools too. Um, the main issue with Docker in general, and that's shared amongst all of those tools that use Docker, is file system performance on Macs and Windows. Linux is like blazing fast, but um, to get Docker to run on, on Windows and Macs, you're using basically like a virtual machine that allows you to run Linux containers, and that virtual machine abstraction isn't as fast um, as if you were just directly on Linux. But that has very recently um, been essentially resolved. So file system performance on Macs, if anyone has experience with that, switch to Virtuo FS and update Mac to the latest operating system and it's it's quite fast. It's, it's still not as fast as like pure Linux, but uh, it's totally doable now. Um, it used to be so painful that you would never want to use it. So we had to do a custom setup where we used a NFS to do the file uh, sharing and that added some headaches. but. So local development is go, goes pretty well. We just have a Docker compose file that sets up a Docker container for the web container and then the database container. Um, the Docker file is uh, really simple. Um, you know, we have to update the Docker file, I don't know, like once a year, every time that we update our PHP dependencies. So we make sure that everyone's on the same version of PHP, the same version of Git and uh, like Composer, things like that. So all the commands that we're running for our local development um, we run it within the web container. Uh, we use the Acquia BLT, stands for Build Launch Tool. So this platform is hosted on Acquia's uh, Site Factory platform, and <coughs> Acquia developed um, some tooling around that to make it a little easier. So Acquia BLT, it lets you create what are called build artifacts. So you're basically taking your development repository, which has all the code, and you're creating a new version of that that's suitable for deploying to Acquia's uh, environment. So that'll basically strip away stuff you don't want on the production server that you need on the development server, your local environment. So all of the composer dependencies you use for uh, like migrating sites and um, like running unit tests and bhat and stuff like that, uh, that won't get uh, included in the artifact that gets deployed. Uh, BLT has been really nice. I've been super happy with it. Uh, BLT is also used for syncing down sites from production to our local environment. We did a little bit of customization here to make it work really well with multi-site. But basically, uh, any of the developers or designers on our team can just run a command to sync down the production site for any of our sites into our local environment. Um, and we get basically a clone of it. Uh, it doesn't sync down the files, it just syncs down the database. Um, and it enables the stage file proxy module which uh, is used for downloading files as they're needed. So if, you know, if you're rendering the home page and it's like trying to load like five images, since we didn't sync down the, the files, uh, instead of displaying a broken image, that module actually, actually proxy the request to the production server to download the image on demand as needed. So instead of downloading you know, you know, 100 megabytes of images or something, you're downloading like one megabyte, unless you like browse through the whole site and everything gets downloaded. Um, 
Yeah, we're using Bitbucket pipelines to do our, um, well, two, two things. It's, it's running every time we do a pull request for including new code in the platform, uh, pipelines kicks off and runs our BHAT test suite. So this is our automated test suite that runs. It takes about an hour and 15 minutes to run through all of the tests, but BHAT has been uh, pretty great at catching regressions. Um, if we didn't have this, I'd be really afraid to upgrade Drupal and Drupal modules. Uh, so it'll do things like uh, it controls a headless Chrome browser and it will go in and log in as a site admin or a content manager and add a page and then add a page list block to a page and make sure that the output is what you expect. Uh, this has been hugely important in avoiding regressions, um, you know, especially as we upgraded from like Drupal 8, 8 to 9 um, and lots of contrib module updates. Sometimes it's a little finicky. Um, you know, some of the tests we have flap, which means that they, they fail randomly and if you run the test again, it won't fail. There's a lot of weird race conditions with JavaScript and uh, things I can't explain. Uh, Bitbucket pipelines is nice. I'm assuming that you can do the same thing with GitLab and GitHub, but um, after the pipeline runs, it's just running a Docker container and a command that you tell it to run within that container. Uh, we give it the same exact uh, Docker container that we use for local development, which is nice. But it runs, and then after it's finished running, if it fails, it takes a screenshot of what the Chrome browser would have been seeing at that time of the failure. It takes an HTML dump of the page, and it also exports the database. Um, and you can download all of that for the test failure. So basically recreate the test failure environment in your local environment and debug why the test failed. Um, that's been hugely uh, successful in you know, not, not wasting a lot of time trying to figure out why a test failed. Sometimes tests will only fail in pipelines and not in your local. Those are frustrating, and this is a helpful process to debug that. Uh, and then Tugboat QA. Uh, so this is a spinoff from Lullabot. They uh, created this service to do, um, like, basically Drupal environments. It's not just Drupal, but you can use it for Drupal. Um, but environments on demand. So every time we create a pull request in our code base, uh, a uh, tugboat process kicks off and creates a Drupal site and checks out the code for that branch from the pull request and applies it. Um, and we have it configured to download the database for our demo site, which has a lot of all the possible ways you could configure one of the site builder sites on it. Um, it downloads that database and then it'll do things like run composer install and like drush updb and gives you a link. It posts a link to the, the, the site after it's done building, right in the pull request comments. Um, so you can click it. There's another service um, that ZivTech made called Probo that uh, we used to use as well. So uh, highly recommend uh, Tugboat. That's been really great. So our release process, uh, so it's cyclical. We do a release every month. Uh, for the most part, I think we skipped December this year just because there was a lot of vacations and whatnot happening. But um, so it's always starts with our monthly planning meeting. It's about a two hour meeting. Uh, most of our staff are involved in that. And we basically review everything that happened in the, uh, the previous month, uh, what was just released. This release planning meeting typically happens on the same day as the release. So like I release the code in the morning and then that same day we have the release planning meeting. So I'll give a demo of all the features that were deployed and then basically we talk about what do we want the next release to be like, uh, what features and whatnot. Um, we have a pretty structured process for like what gets evaluated for inclusion in an upcoming release. We have a thousand websites and there's a lot of people that want features. Um, so it's trying to balance um, you know, the wants versus the requirements for uh, you know, immediate projects that we're working on. We are cost recovery. so. Uh, you know, a lot of the stuff that we're spending time on, we have to, you know, recover the cost. So sometimes if a site's willing to pay for a feature, we'll prioritize it to get it in because they're willing to pay for it. Other times, um, if it's a feature that we know clearly everybody wants, we'll prioritize it. Um, but like my director Jill said in, in her talk, this platform is meant for, a, you know, a lot of websites. We can't we can't build solutions that are really just for like one or two websites. Oh, you know, we spend a lot of time to build it and even more time to maintain it over time. And the impact is much less than as if we spend time developing features that 
had an impact on maybe like 20 to 30 percent of the websites versus like one or two percent. Um, so that's what goes into a lot of our planning. Uh, lately, because we're in a big project to migrate all of our old Drupal 7 sites to Drupal 9, we have to develop features on the platform to support those migrations. A lot of the reasons that those old sites were considered Drupal 7 custom sites is because they had features that were fairly custom. Um, a PPPL intranet website we're working on right now, that site um, uses a different authentication system to log in because uh, it's Plasma Physics Lab. They have a whole separate directory of people that use this Active Directory Federated Services instead of our centralized CAS service. So like, we need to develop that feature to make that work. Um, so we'll do that planning meeting. We schedule what's going to go in the next release. We assign out who's going to work on it, that sort of thing. Project managers are involved. Uh, any projects that they're working on, they have the opportunity to say, like, okay, we definitely need this. Um, we use JIRA to manage all of this. We have, like, swim lanes to track progress as things move throughout um, the development process. Uh, code review. So I review all of the code that gets in from the developers. Um, and you know we have a collaboration system where I'll review it. And, you know go, we'll go back and forth, and things like that. Uh, code quality is run on the the pull requests automatically to make sure that they're following the coding standards. Um, so uh, Jess, she's a Drupal core maintainer. She gave a great talk earlier about like code review and how she does code review for Drupal core. It was a really fascinating talk. Um, but she said like one of the worst things is nitpicking in um, code review. So like you as a code reviewer feel bad doing it because uh, you're like nitpicking something small that really doesn't have an impact on the feature. Like the feature's gonna run the same, but maybe like the way they implemented this is like pretty different than how you've been doing it in the past. Um, and you wanna sort of have, like enforce those standards so that like years from now when you go back to the code, everyone, like it's all the same style. Like everything's just easier to read and parse through. You wanna make sure people are adding comments to code. Um, that's, that's one thing I always harp on in code reviews is the comments should not describe what the code is doing. They should describe the intent. Like, why, why is it doing this? You, you know, the code should, it's PHP, it's, it's pretty self-descriptive. <laughs> like, if you read it and it's written in a clean way, just, you know, reading through the code, you could typically understand what it's doing. But why? Why is this code here? Like, why, why is this magic number 80 used? You have, anytime there's a magic number in code, make sure it's documented, like, why did you choose 80? Um, so, so, th so that's our process for getting code merged in. And then we have a testing and release process. So one week before our code deployment, and our code deployment is always the um, third week of the month. Uh, it's split up into two days, uh, Wednesday and Thursday. Wednesday, we deploy to our first uh, half of the sites. Uh, it takes uh, anywhere between two and a half to four hours to do the code deployment. Uh, I get up at 4 a.m. and do it. <laughs> uh, it's not, you know, it, it's not great, but it's like a, it's a time where um, there's very few people like administrators going in and administering the website. Um, and Site Factory, Aqua Site Factory makes the process uh, um, pretty pain, pain free. So the way it works is uh, it's sort of a green blue deployment setup where uh, there's to doc routes and we deploy the updated code to one doc route and then selectively a few sites at a time we put them in maintenance mode switch them over to the new doc route run the drupal database updates clear cache and then take the site out of maintenance mode and we do that for all the sites until they're all done uh, the reason you do that instead of just you know deploying the code to all 500 sites right at the same time is you need to clear cache on all the sites and you need to run database updates on the sites. Database updates might do things like manipulate data or configuration of the site. Because the sites are all in shared hosting, you can't just run that command simultaneously for 500 websites, it'll crash the server. It's just like too demanding on the database server. So we only do a few sites at a time and it goes uh, until it finishes all 500 sequentially. Uh, so we split that up between Wednesday and Thursdays and uh, yeah, the testing process, we'll sync down the sites to our dev environment, we'll do some visual regression testing. Um, you know, we have some sites that we make sure definitely the sites look the same, didn't break. Um, like I said, I'll, we have a long tail of sites that don't receive a lot of traffic and a small percent that receive a lot. We want to make sure, like canvas.princeton.edu, for example, we just had a problem with the most recent release with that. But um, that's a site that students go to all the time as a portal to log into Canvas. Canvas is like a, uh, the student learning management system at Princeton. It used to be Blackboard. 
the website for canvas.princeton.edu is not the service, but it's like the front page to Canvas that students go to get into Canvas. So we want to make sure that at least the home page is up and running because that's the button that everybody clicks to do that. The same thing with uh, the registrar's website. There's a link to Tiger Hub on there, which is what students use to pick courses. Um, we want to make sure that that link is actually working because you know if that's down, then uh, not great. So that's all part of our monthly testing process there. Um, deploying a QA, we have a QA environment, um, and deploying a prod. So uh, performance monitoring, uh, we use New Relic for application performance monitoring. This is a screenshot I took yesterday, I think. Um, the solid line is the throughput to our origin servers, our servers in Acquia. Um, so basically the requests per minute that are getting into our origin servers. And the dashed line is the same time period from 24 hours earlier. Uh, so we were having an issue where we were just getting a lot of traffic to our origin servers. Um, Acquia bills us sort of based on how much traffic we get to our origin servers. So we have um, you know, a vested interest in reducing that amount. So uh, one of the things we did in the most recent release is improve the cacheability of a lot of these requests. Uh, so that the Varnish caching server, and we're using Cloudflare too, can cache more of the, the content so the origin server is not being hammered over and over again for the same requests. So uh, we had a pretty significant reduction there with the most recent release. You know, my point is here that we have monitoring and we have uh, the data to let us know that there's problems and let us know that changes we make uh, have made an impact and a difference. This is a, another screenshot of the response time of the origin server. And um, you can see that we had uh, this area in the middle here is the response time of the database server, MySQL. And you can see that it was really bad for a while. And um, you know, as we um, have been migrating more and more sites to the platform, we you know, need to be monitoring this to make sure that we're not overloading the database server. Um, in this case, the database server got to a point where its CPU was pegged at 100% um, just all the time. It was always at 100%. So requests were really starting to slow down. So um, we got Aqua to upsize the server, and that was the impact after they upsized the server and rebooted it. So just having this data is just so helpful. If we didn't have this insight, sometimes I think I would sleep better because I wouldn't like you almost, it's better to not know what you don't know, but um, this has made debugging issues. Like without this, I don't know how I would debug certain issues. Uh, I would say, so like if, if we started from scratch and had to start today, things I might do differently. Um, I would do even more planning up front. Uh, a lot of time that we've spent has been refactoring code to accommodate solutions that we implemented after we already launched 250 sites on the platform. That like, oh, I wish we thought of this like in the initial planning phase. Um, it's sort of a, a double-edged sword because there's only so much you can plan before you start getting real sites on the platform and seeing what the needs are. And also the needs change, right? So what we knew when we were developing sites 10 years ago is not true now. So. It's, it's hard to say when someone, we redesign a site, the design system changes. Like what, what our designers want to use on a site requires different technology to implement. So in some cases it's hard to do all that planning up front for a platform that takes years and years to build. Um, so, but yeah, the refactorings have been painful uh, for sure. But to that point, I wish you know we had more data insights in the beginning too about what features were used um, and you know, so when we spend a lot of time, like, oh, I went to a talk this morning from FFW talking about just planning for multi-sites and um, not spending time on features that nobody's using. She talked about um, image galleries and sliders, and they put Google Analytics trackers on the arrows. It's like nobody was clicking the arrows. And like, we generally know that in WDS that sliders people don't interact with, but everybody tends to want sliders. Um, <laughs> So it's, it's like hard to convince people that like, ah, you don't need them, but you can't convince someone that unless you have the data to back it up. So I, w I wish we, we spent more time on that in the beginning, um, but you know, now we can do that now. As like, once we're finished with the migration, we'll have more time to do things like that. Um, 
implement better visual regression testing system. I spent a lot of time every month uh, just manually visually regression testing a lot of sites to make sure that we didn't break something because we don't have an automated system to do it yet. Uh, I would love to be able to click a button and say, uh, you know, take a screenshot of the, the top level menu items for these five sites and compare it against the code I'm about to deploy. Um, there are some solutions out there that can help us do that, um, but just spending the time to do it, I think if I added up all my collective hours I spent just doing it manually, like it probably would have been easier just upfront to spend the time and do a system properly to automate a lot of it. And uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. So any questions? I know this is the last session. I'll, I'll be around for a while if anyone wants to grab me too. I didn't, I didn't get all that, but you're saying there's so many contrib solutions out there. Surely some of them, we could use some of them instead of all the custom code. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so there are, for, there's a lot of, here's what I'll say. Contrib modules are somebody else's custom code <laughs> that you have less control over. So the custom code we write has tests for it, and it's not, most of the time it's not suitable for a contrib space and that it's very specific to our platform and how we built it and, and run it. And other times that's not the case. Like layout builder styles is a module that we wrote and we contributed that back. And it's a very popular module. Um, CK editor styles is the same way. So a lot of the solutions when I'm coming up with them, I'm like, okay, is there a contrib module that does this? Is it suitable for a platform? Meaning that is the UI for it going to be friendly to a site admin who doesn't know Drupal? Um, I don't need the UI for all that stuff. And uh, if not, can we build one? Um, and is that suitable for contributing it back? Sometimes that is. Like we just, I put one up um, to do simple media bulk uploads and I, I create a control module for that. Um, so it, it's all a balance. I mean. Just because there's a contrib module out there, it, you know, the maintainer maybe has moved on or he's not super responsive, and it's a lot, oftentimes it's a lot of work to, to maintain a contrib module. Um, you know, and eventually the longer the contrib module's out there, the, the bigger bloat it will have as it tries to adapt to, to, um, to deal with other people's uh, feature requests and things like that. It's a good question though, and it's something I, I'm, always, I'm always dealing with. It also helps that Brian's really good at writing pieces. <laughs> um, when you're implementing new features or even the things that you already have, like, I know this is a broad question, so you don't have to answer it in detail, but like, what kind of things are you saying, okay, these tests have to be in? Oh, for automated testing? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, like I don't, I don't know that I necessarily have like a framework for for what I do. I follow, but the default should be to have a test written for it, at least testing like the basics of it. Um, it's it's easy to try to convince yourself when you're adding a new feature that you don't need the test because it's not fun writing them, right? Especially, uh, B hat. I mean, it, it's okay, but it, it's not great. Oftentimes, I wish we had a different tool available, and I'm sure there's some better stuff out there. Um, but I, I always want to make sure that um, if, it's, if it's something that's fairly unique or, or something that we're not going to be interacting with often, that it definitely has tests. Um, because it's not something I'm probably going to test manually during the monthly release. That's something I'm leaning on the automated test suite for. Yeah. It's a good question. Database, each page in that thing, and you can at least check that 
it? Yeah, so uh, FFW um, wrote a tool that uses backstop.js for that. Okay. Um, well, they'll, they'll actually crawl the, um, the old site and the new one, and they'll, they'll do that to, to catch like big errors. It's really difficult to do that though because the themes are so dramatically different. So any visual regression testing, it's always gonna be different, right? Um, but yeah, I think they wrote a tool that, that, crawls, um, that crawls the pages that way. Yeah, I think that answers your question. Was it, was it useful? Yeah, I mean, they, so they have their own QA team and, and they're doing all of that. They do some visual regression testing and testing before they hand it off to us and we'll do a little bit more and then the client does some too before we switch over. Um, but we still miss some stuff. Uh, a lot of these old custom sites we built, we don't remember why we did things, or we don't remember, there's some sites that had, I think history, the history site had like 70 unique views displays. Um, so it's daunting to go in and have to figure out like, okay, are all these views displays even used? And just seeing that is why we have our site building guide <laughs> by the way, so like we don't build views that have 70 displays. Um, and what, you know, while there are four or five different ways to do something in Drupal 9, that we just pick one way and always do it that way, even if it's not the perfect, most ideal way to do it. Because at least it's standard, at least we know how to maintain it, and it'll be easier to upgrade. I don't know if we're gonna be on Drupal 10 years from now or whatever, but the next major upgrade we do, you know, the fewer customizations we'll have to deal with. CSS injector is a totally different story. We're still doing CSS injector, which is gonna make it a nightmare next time we upgrade again, but that's Princeton. Everyone wants a different look and feel, so. When you pick modules from Contrib uh, repos, does it go through some security uh, review process? Well, we don't have a formal process for that. Other than, other than me looking at it. Yeah, so the question was uh, when we pick contrib modules to use, do we have a security review process? Um, beyond me, like looking at the module and the code, no. Um, we do have a formal architecture security review, review board at Princeton, um, but that's typically more for um, onboarding new services to Princeton, like from a vended product. Not so much like, uh, they're not gonna have a lot of, to input on like what Drupal module we should be allowed to use or not. Um, they sort of leave that up to us. Yeah. Uh, how are you handling your configuration deploy strategy? Yeah, oh yeah, that's something I meant to cover. I totally forgot about that. Um, so we don't use Drupal's formal config management system. Um, in our architecture document where I reviewed the config management strategies. Um, oh. Yeah, closing remarks are help. Yeah, okay. All right. Thanks, everybody.